Welcome back to Open Relationships Transforming Together. My name is Andrea Miller, the host. I'm joined by my amazing co-host, Joanna Schroeder, and our incredible producer, Brian Atkins. And we have an amazing guest today, somebody whose work is so beautiful and so moving, Rebecca Wolf. Rebecca Wolf is the author of two books, has a substack called The Braid, publishes essays across the web, has been featured in the New York Times, Time Magazine, New York Mag, CNN, NPR, and beyond. She is the host of the podcast No Shame with Rebecca Wolf, which is launching this summer. Rebecca lives in LA with her son and three daughters. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for having me, guy. Um, all right, let's just jump in to all of this, a memoir of death and desire. You're beautiful, brave, radically honest, and very controversial book. Hmm. I mean, there's a lot to dig into. I think it would be instructive for our listeners and viewers to give some context to it because not everybody will have sure. have read it. Yeah, and yeah. So do you want to give it a go? Yeah, Just for sure. Write. So um, I wrote a book about my experience navigating the death of my husband. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer the day before he turned 44. He died four months later. Um Right before he was diagnosed, we had essentially had the it's time to call the marriage conversation, which was a conversation we had had multiple times before. But this is like this is the this this is it. I was finally going to leave. And then he got sick. Um, and so in those four months while he was dying, I took care of him. I was arguably the best version of myself as a wife to him in that time. But along with the grief that I experienced, obviously, in losing him and my kids losing their father, there was relief because I didn't want to be married to him anymore. So um, in the months after his death, I there was there was a lot of, I'm free now, in the same way you would like after a marriage, if you went through a divorce, like, mm -hmm. I'm free. Like this, the picture of Nicole Kidman, right, coming out of that. Mm -hmm. But so I had all these feelings that I wasn't able to that were not societally acceptable for a widow to feel. So I was having sex, a lot of sex, a lot of doing a lot of dating very secretly mm -hmm. because I didn't want to be judged for it. Um, and I remember like very soon after he died, people started to bring me these books about widows and the widow experience and none of them I mm -hmm. were like, I didn't identify with any of them. It were none of them were my experience. I felt like there was nobody who was talking about the experience I had, which I knew couldn't have been yeah. like, True. like that. I knew I wasn't the only one feeling that because I had a lot of friends who run unhappy marriages. I know a lot of women who run unhappy marriages. And if you're in an unhappy marriage and your husband dies, that unhappy marriage doesn't suddenly become happy. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. And so I felt I wrote the book that I did not have, which was a book called All of This because when my husband was dying, he had said, you have to write about all of this when I die. Obviously, he probably wasn't aware of how all of this I would, what I would write about. Mm -hmm. But he acknowledged that like I was a writer and I wrote about my life and I would most likely write about this experience too. But also, you know, all of this as in there's so much that goes on when someone dies. It's so complicated and we simplify it specifically when it comes to a partner and there is no support for women who were in a position like me who felt very complicated grief. Um, and so I wrote the book that I didn't have offering that to people. And in the last few years, I talked to widows. I mean, I've talked, heard from hundreds of widows around the world who had my experience, who still don't feel like they can talk about it without mm -hmm. being judged or shamed or scrutinized for being insensitive. Um, and so, you know, this has been the work that I've done the last few years is not only talk about the nuances of loss and grief when it comes to um, partners who've lost their partners, but also of kids who've lost their parents, who had complicated relationships yeah. with their parents um, and, and, and so on. Like death is always complicated. I mean, what I think is remarkable, I'm a mother of two sons, 11 and 14. And why I think your book is controversial because you said a lot a, you know, things that, that your kids will eventually read, probably have read about the the prodigious amount of sex that you had and your complicated feelings. And you taught, you even told your kids that you cheated on your husband. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like you broke a lot of norms. Yeah. And, but uh, I, I wanted to understand, like, did you, when you sat down to write this, 
did you know that you were going to write, I mean, way more than just a biography about that part of your life. Oh, like yeah. the, it was a much bigger, bigger revelation that gives volume to so many women's experience. For sure. Well, first, I've been a memoirist since I was 16. So I've always written about my experiences. And so this was not like a new, this was definitely like a more, I went way farther out into like the honesty pasture mm -hmm. with this book. Radical, but I, I mean, like it's yeah. super radical yeah. honesty. Well, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that when you're like living with death, even for four months, you're like, oh, I don't know how much longer I'm gonna have either. Like mm -hmm. totally. there is a perspective that you get as a caretaker that is also very specific to your experience, regardless of who you're taking care of. And I think for me, it was like, okay, I'm alive. I have not, like, fuck it. Yeah, like, there was a little. There's a little yep. bit of that for sure, and a little or a lot, a lot, <laughs> a lot of that. And also because I, I was, I basically got to a point where people were coming up to me all the time, like feeling so sorry for me, giving me so much pity, and I was like, like I had, I had a breaking point where I was like, oh my god, enough, actually, like I'm okay, and this is why I've grieved this relationship mm -hmm. years ago. Um, and it felt, it got to the point where it was like, I felt like I had to be performative in order to, um, just to like placate everyone else's feelings. And it just felt yeah. false to me. And over time it just became, got to the point where I was like, this isn't, I'm not being honest with myself or anybody else. And I just got to a point where I was like, I, I, I need to be, I want to be. And I also think, think it's very generous to write honestly about your experience, especially knowing that you're going to get hate for it. Yeah. And Every woman that I look up to, that I admire as an artist, as a friend in my community are women that were willing to be generous with their truth, knowing it would get them into trouble. So I, you know, like that sort of became when I sat down to write this book, I was like, if I write about this book, if I write about my complicated marriage, I have to talk about my affairs. Yeah. I know so many people who have written memoirs who talk about one part of the affair or the other person's affair and never talk about theirs. Like, I. I, that drives me, like, yeah. if you're going to be honest, if you're going to tell a full story, especially about a marriage, you can't, no one's the hero, no one's the victim, everyone's just human. And so my husband is human. He did a lot of things in our marriage that weren't okay. I'm human. I did a lot of things in our marriage that weren't okay. And I wrote about that experience. And that doesn't mean that my grief is any less than anyone else's. Um, it just means that I, I feel compelled to share because I did talk a lot about the grief and like there was sadness, of course, and there always will be. And and a lot of that was tied into my kids losing their father. Um, and that was very real for me. But there was this other part of it that was also very real for me and also very valid, which was, oh, my God, I don't have to deal with his bullshit anymore. Yeah. Which well, so this there's I've been fascinated with the I call it the why of of monogamy that. That we we get married and we're like we're gonna have this monogamous marriage and and marriage in America is monogamous. It's not. Some people are monogamous, some people are polyamorous, and the rest of everybody else, which is the majority, there's been affairs. Right. And but for some reason we make monogamy this norm. It's more like it's a goal. And I think there's a goal well, and a goal for some. A goal for some, yeah, yeah, and fine, great for them. I love it. It's a goal in my marriage. It's been that's you know it's something that's super important to my husband and I. You know, I care about him. Let's do it. But it seems uniquely cruel to write a biography about your life or your marriage and not include infidelity if that was a huge part of it. And I'm not, I don't want to shame people into telling something that's they're not ready to tell. But on the other hand, it's like, you know how many of these people are writing about their amazing marriages, their amazing families. They're just full of shit because there's been affairs well, but and they're what, never going to say it. Yeah. What I what I love about your book, what, what rang through like so clearly like a bell was the gift you gave yourself by telling the truth. And yeah. I, again, I, you did and that. And other people. Well, totally. And yeah. not, you know, I mean, just in, in ways not as overly as you, <laughs> you know, I've, I've told these hard truths and that's what you realize it's a gift you give yourself and you know you're, that you, it's going to hurt. I, I talk about like walking into the flame mm -hmm. and and yet there's, it's like no substitute for that. Yeah. I think like I am someone who doesn't feel a lot of shame and if I've ever felt shame, it was because I didn't feel enough of it. And I think also with age, I've gotten to a point where I'm like, actually, this is awesome that I don't feel shame and I need to do something with this. This is a gift. Mm -hmm. And so 
because I truly don't. Like people have come at me with every kind of criticism and I can tell you that like I don't, it doesn't. It really doesn't get to you. It doesn't affect me and I don't know oh, if that's That's a superpower. Been, yeah, yeah, for sure. But also like if someone that loved me, that knew me like personally came to me and like said, it would be very different. Like people who don't know me are going to, like that does not affect me. But I also think like, and you know this too, because you've been writing on the internet forever. Like I've only ever my entire life since I was 16 years old, written publicly about my life and gotten shamed for it. So if you've been doing, you've been doing something for like 25 years, yeah, you can't keep doing that unless you find a way to like, for it not to, and obviously like, it, like, I feel it, but it doesn't, I don't think about it anymore. I don't lose sleep over it. It doesn't stop me. It doesn't, and if anything, it makes me even like double down even more because I realize how important it is. Because I'm like, oh, people are so angry about this thing that's so innocuous that everybody's clear, everyone feels. Well, have you noticed like the things that they hated you or hated me for 10 years ago now are so normal? Like, I was like just talking about the fact that I was like, no, I, I was talking about. We shouldn't be saying boys will, boys will be boys about our sons, right? People were like, you're raising these little sissy men. Nobody says boys will be boys now. It's like, it was normal, but it was like, I feel bad for your sons. They're going to be raised to be weak. Trying to make me feel ashamed for wanting to raise different types of boys. Now everybody's on board with that. I think it's a ninja move and so wise to... To recognize, first of all, I want to give props to your parents. You write about them in your acknowledgments. Yeah. And, um, you know, you wrote something that I think would be hard for a lot of parents to read. Mm -hmm. And it means just props to mom and dad and then and to your friends and to your kids and the people like you described. The people that matter to you have stood by you. What's yeah. interesting to me about all this, oh my God, it's like... I'm getting, you know, hate mail on or, you know, hate tweets or, or mm -hmm. whatever from strangers. And yeah. even I, I'm not that I'm all that active on social media. Every now and then I'll get like some kind of criticism. I'm like, why do I care yeah. about what a stranger feels about something that I wrote? Like it's so misinterpreted. Yeah. And every now and then I'll, I'll like actually try to honestly engage. Yeah. And it's like, why, why do we care? So, I mean, good for you to have developed that not even a thick skin. It, I mean, truly, it feels like a wisdom. It also, you know what it feels like to me too? Like, cause I always say like, like I would not respect myself as a writer or an artist or even a woman if I wasn't doing something that wasn't pissing yep. people off. Yeah, like, there's, a, me, there's an ethos like, in that. Point? If you're not yeah. pushing a lot. Yeah, to me, yeah. it's like, if you're, if you're gonna, if you're gonna write the truth and if no one's gonna push back, then you're not being honest enough, period, right? Like. So it's, you're provoking some sort of response. That to me means that I'm doing my job and it's, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And if I didn't have the skin for it, I wouldn't be doing it. And plenty of people don't, and that's fine. But for those of us that do, that's why I do feel like it's really generous. Like if you can do it, if you have the skin for it, if you can like get in the ring, you should, you have to, like you have to. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I, I do think like there is a part of me that like, if you push me, I'll just, I'll go even deep. I'll go, I'll double down. Because mm -hmm. there's also like a part of me that's very contrarian that will do whatever you tell me not to do. So the more you fuck with me or the more you come at me with criticism, the more I'm going to be like, I guess this is what I'm going to write about next. <laughs> yeah, well, and there, I mean, there's something amazing about that dynamic. I mean, this, you know, the show, whole show of open relationships, how, I mean, relationships are a forge, right? Yeah. And even if it's a relationship with a stranger that is causing you to double down, it's yeah. like there is a, a pre, you know, uh, heat and pressure yeah. that is causing yep. you to to change and respond. All right, I want to read this uh, quote. What if we weren't afraid of being chastised for our humanity? What if we felt safe enough to open the parts of ourselves we have been culturally conditioned to keep closed, didn't have to call each other brave for saying the things we know to be true, and instead of protecting our families from knowing our pain, allowed them to understand what we risk by saying nothing. So many of us say nothing, raise our daughters to say nothing. Send the message to our sons that no matter what they do to us, we will say nothing. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, like, I want everybody to, you know, who's listened to this, watch this, to repeat, you know, like rewind yeah. and listen to this again, because that's how we are conditioned. And I feel like yeah. your, your writing is, for me again, as a, as a mom with kids, a leader in the different roles that I play, it's like, we are so enculturated to make it safe for other people. Yeah and to keep quiet, keep the masks on. Mm -hmm. And that's where I feel like like you're you're right. In fact, um, a media director of a 
board I was on, a theater board I was on talked about artists as modern shamans. Mm. And so I just, I, I agree that it's, it's scary to yeah. tell these truths. It can be scary, maybe not always. Um, but I, I think that's that's the gift. Yeah, and I think our mother just weaponized against us. If you have kids, you can't write about sex. Yep. If you have kids, you can't write about this. And this idea that we have to protect our kids as opposed to prepare them is so damaging, especially for those of us who are raising daughters and sons. Mm-hmm. But to model um, silence, to model complicity, com- to model protection over everything else, right? It's the women's, it's a mother's role to protect the family, to protect the reputation of the, of the man, to protect her children from knowing the truth. I mean, we, we have generations of trauma built on that concept. Yeah. And, and, and that's the lie. I mean, so yeah, when I feel like you, you talk a lot in the book about what you really were seeking, and that was freedom. And it's something that I hold dear as well. It's like, I want to be emotionally free yeah. so I can be fully inhabiting my own body and being with all the flaws, all the triumph and everything. Really. But it takes a lot of fucking courage yeah. to be to to really inhabit our whole beings. Totally. There's this like super romanticization romanticization of our grandmothers. So, like, our grandmothers were we should live like they were and be cooking from scratch. Even not even if it's not trad wives, it's like the idea of sitting down for family dinners and planning our meals and whole ingredients. And that's all lovely. But it's like they forget my grandmother had a great life, but she still um, like couldn't have gotten surgery without her husband's consent. She couldn't have opened a bank account without his consent. She couldn't have left him. She couldn't have just gotten a divorce for no reason. She would have had to prove some horrible thing. Like it was not great. He, she had to starch the bed sheets, and it'd be ninety degrees and humidity in the Midwest, and she had to starch the bed sheets. And nobody said a word. Well, I think that's it. It's like these are norms that are handed down in a lot yeah. like generational trauma. It's like, I, I mean, genetically, we are being handed down and handed yeah. down and handed down and the traumas in, in the cells of our bodies. And so we have to either choose to break those habits and those patterns or just accept it. And I feel like it yeah. really, it takes a lot, a very strong will and a lot of intention to say, okay, it stops with me. It just occurred to me that maybe that generational, like I get enraged about housework, which sounds goofy, but it's not. Like I am so like ashamed when the house isn't nice enough and enraged when my husband is not doing what I think is enough. And all of a sudden I'm thinking about generational trauma. Like this was a huge thing that harmed my grandma's life was this nonstop quest for perfection in her home. And now I'm like, could them there's something in, there's something in there yeah there's something yeah. In there. and i like self-blame and have a much so much shame around it because i'm like feeling bad even that i feel bad so weird now i'm like oh my god no this is a real thing yeah well you you i don't know if you use the word rage in the book but I, you know there's a, a a example or not an example but um you know a, a moment that you talked about where you just it was like grief and stress was at a, a pinnacle probably yeah. one of many yeah. where you literally were breaking dishes yeah. um but there yeah. were other times familiar that, again talking about from sexual assault the night that um trump got elected i mean mm-hmm. there were a handful of times where it was so visceral and i mean the word that bubbled up for me was oh my god that's rage mm-hmm. and i think a lot of us feel that mm-hmm. rage and again it's not necessarily safe to talk about it or mm-hmm. to express it and yet holy crap if we could Right. It's, I feel, I feel embarrassed if I'm talking about the rage I feel and the frustration and the guilt. And yet that's, I feel like that's what we're called to do, particularly as, as women that have the ability and the voices to do so to say, yeah, you're not alone in your fucking rage. Right. Yeah. Well, I always like compare it to the analogy of the lock diary, which like every little girl is given, right? A diary with a lock oh. on it. Mm-hmm. And we're told at least by the, the whole concept of it, right? Is like, Here's a diary for you to protect yourself. This is for your secrets. This is like you mm. lock it to protect yeah, I mean, yourself. Mm. And it occurred to me like, you know, while I was going through this experience and writing my book that the lock diary was not there to protect me. It was there to protect everybody else. And oh. the fact that girls are given these diaries and told them to lock them all, I'll lock away your secrets to protect mm-hmm. you, that we're literally groomed from such a young age to be secretive, to be quiet, to be silent. Yes, if you need to write something down, great. Just lock it away in a diary. Keep and it so, here. Yeah. yeah, keep it inside. Keep it, yeah. Keep Which it. is essentially the opposite of what memoirists do, which right. is to reveal our diaries. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot, like, a lot of us who came up as memoirists, even, like, the, you know, I was a, like, mommy blogger for years. 
that was weaponized against us. We weren't allowed to talk about our experiences. We were bad mothers if we were talking about motherhood honestly. And yeah, what a gave, what a gift it gave to millions and millions and, and millions it changed of everything. Totally, hundred percent. But like that, like to be told that you're being selfish when actually you're being generous, mm -hmm. like. The gaslighting of women writers, women who write about their lives, women who write about motherhood and sex and marriage is so, to me, trans, like, it's so obvious to me now that it is a complete, like, fallacy. And it's a way for, like, you know, society, whoever, well, whatever it's authoritative. Like, it's why books get banned, right? right? Because this, the, 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 um, um, different institutions that want to ban books believe they're going to be subversive and oh god if we give people that insight right then they may start to think on their own no and idea they may get alive. empowered right and so so absolutely especially women yeah especially women yeah mm -hmm. talking about their experiences and especially about experiences that aren't they're not supposed to talk about right it's tmi right mm -hmm. you can't talk about that you can't do that i mean that's i've been hearing that for years i think that's to my point about it not affecting me anymore mm -hmm. like uh, you like after a certain point when someone's telling you something over and over you start to take it as a compliment like yeah. you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. i see you yeah I see you yeah so talk about talk about grief i mean so you you expressed grief from staying in a marriage for 14 years mm -hmm. that you shouldn't have stayed in um and then you then you lost your husband and as you described the grief that you felt for your kids to have lost their dad yeah so prematurely um grief isn't linear you talk about that in your book um what what has grief taught you i mean i think i think first of all grief is like really the most poignant way for you to understand how you feel about the people that you love and also yourself like i think grief is a real mirror to everything like to just to what it is to be a human um i you know, our experience with grief, my experience, I, I think for me, navigating it as a parent, I had to separate my own feelings from my kids in order to get them through that first year. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really common with um, people who lose partners and are raising young children as widows or widowers is the 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 putting your own feelings sort of to the side and mm -hmm. focusing on your kids so i don't even think i knew how i felt or what my particular kind of grief looked like or felt like and i was definitely not ready to like explore that until after i knew that my kids not that their grief is it's forever they're gonna mm -hmm. be hurting yeah. but like i needed to make sure that my kids were okay mm -hmm. and that they so my entire entire first year after my husband died they had complete control with my like shepherding, I guess, of like what to do with their feelings. So like mm -hmm. they designed his headstone. Mm -hmm. um, we did everything we did surrounding the death. It was they they it was what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And they all had different ways of grieving. And so I tried to honor all the different ways of grieving. Um, and really like spent that year prioritizing how they felt and like asking them questions and honoring them and not really talking about how I felt which I then like, you know, later on, it took me to be, to basically get to my own grief. So I do think that when you're navigating grief as a parent with small children, it looks different than like if you're navigating the grief of losing a parent or something, because you are, you are the only yeah, person yeah, there yeah, to yeah, guide yeah, you, yeah, yeah. And so like I've taken, and this is how I am in any sort of crisis, I take on this sort of like Girl Scout troop leader approach mm -hmm. to everything. Like, how can we make this an adventure? Mm -hmm. Let's go to the cemetery. Yeah. We'll have a party at the cemetery, which we did like all the time. Like we yeah. still actually, my husband will be, fit. he would have been 50 on Monday and we're going to throw a 50th birthday party for. Mm. That's really cemetery. wonderful like, to do... honor that for on behalf of yeah. your kids, even yeah. though you had a complicated relationship. Oh my them. God. Well, that's the thing. Like I still, he was still my husband and I still loved him. And like that, this is, see, like that is, this is why it's so important to have the nuanced conversations because I can feel relieved and not have wanted to be married to him and still honor him yeah. and death. And like, I, he had a great funeral and I did ever like, like I, I didn't just, I wasn't just like, yeah, he's dead. Fuck him. Yeah. Which is ha what people were trying to perceive me as being this yeah. like heartless bitch who mm -hmm. like killed her husband because she didn't love him. And then like, was so excited and like dancing on his grave and the truth is we were dancing on his grave but we were dancing on his grave because that's always what we do as a family like that was our way of grieving him and celebrating him but um 
but yeah, you can have all these different feelings at once. You do. Everyone does. When I think about, I mean, just when I think about the grief of being with somebody for a long time that you, you don't want to be in that marriage and then you had to, you, it's like you had to go to the, the edge of the cliff a bunch of times yeah. before you finally said, totally. okay, this is it. What, what was the thing that finally said, this is it? I mean, it's interesting because I now teach a class where I work with a counseling psychologist. We teach a class called Stay or Leave. It's a writing workshop for women who are trying to decide whether they want to stay in their marriages or leave it. And it's oh. basically okay, a writing hang on, workshop. Hang on. I think say say what it yeah, is so people yeah. can find it totally. because I feel like that could be no, a it's like, for it's many like people. No, it's like pretty incredible. It's been, we've been t- teaching it for several months now. It's called Stay or Leave. We actually have two classes. One is writing in the aftermath of divorce for women who've just left marriages and are trying to rebuild their lives. Mm-hmm. And the other class, which is the more popular class, is the Stay or Leave class. Trying to decide. And who oh my God. And we do, uh, it's, they're processing through that, through writing. So um, I, I co-teach it with a psychologist. Wow. Um, so every class we have a different theme and we have prompts and it's private. And so it's like very much like, so it's become this community of women who are there to support each other and their choices. And we don't, we're not telling you how to leave. We're not teaching you. We're not telling yeah, you to stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just we're giving, giving that. The, we're like meeting you catalyst. where you are and we're mm-hmm. validating exactly your experience, which is we, me and that the woman, Mindy, who teaches it is also, she's divorced. We both, are, you know, had the same experience of, of wanting for years to leave and not knowing how to and going back and forth. And these are women who've gone back and forth, um, which is very, very, very common. Maybe everyone has at some point in their marriage had been in that place. But it's it's been incredible um, to be with these women and to also to, to, to see them, like, finally leave because most of them have through this process because... Not only are they been able to like get to where I think they needed to be, which is why they signed up, which is to 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 basically get to a place where they feel like they can confidently go into the next chapter of their lives without their marriages, but also the community of being in a room full of women who are in the same place yeah. and in this having the same nuanced experience because it is it's not that's that what I was going to say. Think most yeah. people yeah. don't have that breaking moment. They don't have the moment where we're like that's it, I'm out. Yeah, it's like death by a thousand cuts. Yes. And then you get to a point where like, if I don't, for me, it was, if I stay in this marriage, I'm going to die. I remember calling my mother hysterically crying and being like, I'm going to die. Mm. And like, that was sort of the irony was that like, the life out of you was the one who was dying. dying. Yeah. But like, I remember that being, you know, yeah, because I truly felt like I was like, I, I, like it got to the point where it, it felt that dire for me. There's a weird thing about stay or go, too. There was a, and I've talked publicly that there was a time when my husband and I were going to break up. In fact, when you and I first met years ago when our kids were really little, we commiserated on the fact that we were miserable. Yeah. Totally. yeah. <laughs> and it was like, I was like, I met someone just like me yeah. who, like, doesn't know what to do. And, I, and, and how do you just, you know, and it was so interesting to bond with you about that then. I've stayed with my husband, but I remember one time when I was about to leave, one of my best friends told a story of a friend who was about to leave, and then they ended up staying together and are really happy. And there was a weird thing just about that. I was like, oh, that's a thing too? Yeah, for sure. It was like, Internal. there's a binary yeah. of like, you're happy to get there forever and nothing ever went wrong, or you're miserable and you get divorced. And I was like, okay, well, that opened up options. Like, we have this lie about the binary too. Well, oh, I, let me, sure. I, I mean, I, I've uh, read, and I think so many of us have read and, and heard, you know, from people that were close to these stories, especially about abusive abused women, yeah. some men too, but mostly abused women, that it's it's hearing somebody else's courage to yeah. leave mm-hmm. gives them, it's like, okay, I can see myself in that. And so that, you know, and it feels like it's got to be really lonely and uncertain for so many women because yeah. so many so much of this isn't shared or you hear yeah, it out there, course. but if it's not in your inner circle of close girlfriends, and I mean, as for me anyway, as a working mom, yes, I have people that I'm close to that I love, but I'm not in touch with super close girlfriends every day. Like yeah. I'm not sharing my intimate stuff yeah. hardly at all, yeah. right? And so I could see how that class- a lot, a lot of women don't have that built-in community, right? But depending on where they live, what, what they're, mm-hmm. where they are sort of mm-hmm. in the country, because it mm-hmm. does make a difference, right? Yeah. Like, and so there's a lot of people that don't have the kind of support that they deserve within mm-hmm. their community. And so it's important to find that and to be somewhere with someone. Again, I think judgment, I think shame, like those are my big things. Like 
when people come into the class, it's like, we don't judge. If someone in this room buried, killed someone, we all have to agree to bury the body together. Like, <laughs> we are, this is a ride yeah. or die group. Yeah. Whatever yeah, is said nice. in here, we are going to validate and support you. Period. And a lot of women have had affairs, by the way, which is, yeah. that's my shit. Because that's, I'm like, let's talk about our affairs. And that's a big part of it is like talking about that and being in a space where women can talk about that and not have to say, don't judge me, but, or yeah. I, you know, I, I don't want you to think differently than me, but which is always, whenever you talk about any, really anything pertaining to anything a woman does, which isn't like, ding, like hail over your head, there's always a disclaimer. There's always this ca caveat. And it's like, no, just tell me the, tell, let's talk about what happened. And then let's talk about what you're going to do next. Like, we're not going to talk about wh what we feel bad about. We're going to, you know, we're going to really make space for what are we going to do from here and not like, you know, not dwell on the the shame and the regret and all these, you know, words that we feel like we have to use when we talk about. Well, it and just, what comes to mind for me is I, I feel like when we're not, when we don't give ourselves permission to be whole yeah. and to be authentic mm -hmm. and accountable yeah. to ourselves, yeah. then we judge others. 100%. Then we are resentful. Exactly. And so I felt like yeah. only I can reclaim myself. Totally. Oh, and, and it's scary and it takes courage. And again, I think that's why your book resonated so much with me. It's like, oh my God, yes. Like you've done it, right? And I realize it's not the, you know, it's like you're still doing it, but. But, but no, that's like such, a, that's exactly what I say. I like the the idea, like if you're not, you do not judge others if you don't judge yourself, period. And right. like, it's always what I always say to people too, is like, if you find yourself judging someone in this room or out mm -hmm. outside, you need to get curious and ask yourself 100%. why. What's what that, that prickling? Yes, yeah. because we don't, uh, one does not judge others if they don't judge themselves, period. So if you're judging others, it comes from, right? Like it's yeah, so yeah, totally. connected. It's all we are it all is. mirrors of each other. Yeah, totally. And like, yeah. Well, so, oh, sorry. There's an interesting thing. It's one reason I think this group sounds amazing is sometimes it feels like you can get in with a group of women that you can tell your truth to about the problems in your marriage or an affair. And those women sometimes don't want you to stay together. And maybe what's best for you is to work it out. So I love the idea that you're like, we don't care. Yeah. Yeah. You're it's not, not attached to the outcome. It's, it's not a process. process. I mean, that's what therapy is, right? That's why yeah. you go to therapists is because they're not, they're like a third party. They're someone who's not connected to our entire life. And there is totally something with that. Also, like, like you were saying before, if it's a lot easier to jump when you have someone to hold your hand to do it. So mm -hmm. I think also, or that you've seen that someone has gone first right. and the and water is deep enough and they're yeah, like, oh my surfaced. God, I just, I hired a lawyer and this is what's happening. And they're like, oh shit, now I can do that too. And also on the other side of that, you have people who are like, wait, I'm not ready. Yep, I don't yeah. want to leave. Yep. Actually, wait, no, no, you guys, I'm at, like, I'm, I'm good now. I figured out that I'm, yeah. I think I know. So it's that. And it's, it's also just like writing is so powerful, especially when you're like, the the power that one has like it's one thing to say something out loud and it's quite another to come home and to really write about it or to write about it in class because you're able to get you're able to like you're to articulate things emotionally that you aren't able to say out loud that you wouldn't be willing to necessarily well say and that out. yeah i feel like so many of us find that white journaling journaling is so powerful for mm -hmm. me personally also typing doesn't get me anywhere nearly as close to my own truth as physically writing, writing yeah. um, pen to paper. And it's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that consciously, unconsciously I knew. And I mean, honestly, it's like all this why somatic and therapies yeah. that work in our bodies because it's like- but I also think that's really interesting because I do think that that is like connected to like your inner child. Well, exactly. Oh, that's how you learned how to verbalize. So like, I think yeah. for example, my kids who are not like they don't feel that like they feel that way about their notes app, you know, on mm -hmm. their phone or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's because it yeah. but it does. I feel the same way. It reminds me of being a child, like my inner mm -hmm. child. And I also like I do go back to like that, like who who you like we get to a point as women, I think, where we think that we've learned so much. Um, and I know there's this question that always comes up. And I actually on my podcast, I ask all my guests this question because it's like very much like the question where that, that that's like an ass at everything where it's like what advice would you give your your child self what advice as a 43 year old mm -hmm. woman mm -hmm. would you give your 16 year old self which i find mm -hmm. to be like so patronizing like insinuating mm -hmm. that i know so much and i knew mm -hmm. so little then mm -hmm. when the truth is i've needed to unlearn mm -hmm. so yeah. much shit over the last 30 that's years yeah. that my 16 year old self 
Mm -hmm. didn't like already fucking knew. Mm. So I always like, like go the other direction. Mm -hmm. Like what advice would your 16 year old, like the the girl who didn't care what anyone think, who went got here, seeing that her mom told her not to, what advice would she give you now? Oh, nice. And it's like, to your point about the, about handwriting and like getting into your, it's like, how do we, how do we remember who we were? Mm -hmm. Right. Especially when we're going through a transitional period and like, we talk all the time about like, well, what, what advice would you give your daughter would you, if she was in a bad marriage or if she was in a toxic marriage? But like, actually think about yourself, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, like what advice would you at 16 give you if yeah, she's that's you awesome. Now? She'd be like, get the fuck out. Like, yeah. Yeah, why are, why are you, you doing, doing that? that? Yeah. She'd be like outside revving, you know, the engine in like your yeah. Hyundai. Oh, yeah. Hyundai yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. so funny. Driving the minivan. Metro. Yeah, or whatever like 16 year old car you had. Um, okay, I want to come back to beyond even grief, how ephemeral our lives are, how ephemeral so much is, which especially in our Western society, yeah. we, we don't do a good job with that. Yeah. Like we want everything to be not only you know predictable and in control of it, we want it to last. And I feel like you mm-hmm. paid beautiful homage from having one night stands. Oh, I love one night stands. That you just yeah. enjoyed. I mean, it reminds yeah. me of like, honestly, like, like the most amazing meal or yeah. performance art. It's not meant to last. Yeah. yeah. And so you write, okay, I promise. This is the last thing I'm gonna write, but I, I saw read, to but I but, <laughs> but but I think it's so important because we all think we're gonna fucking live forever and that everything is meant to last. And as and especially as moms, I mean we're all at different phases of young kids, medium, older, kids graduating, and I feel like we end up feeling so much grief and um, discomfort that is unnecessary because somehow we're, we expect everything to last and we don't, I don't we think don't we know how to let go. Right. Yeah. So you write the further I got from loss, the closer I get to understanding or the, excuse me, the further I get from loss, the closer I get to understanding what it means to love without consequence. I don't expect longevity. Everything that lives will also die. And that includes feelings, moments, experiences we share with the people who change our lives. This is the gift of death. This is the gift of rebirth. I mean, I get chills, like, mm-hmm. reading that. Yeah. Well, that's why death, I think, is a gift, especially, like, uh, I mean, obviously, we we don't want people that we love to die young or unexpectedly, but there is a gift to being around, um, you know, unexpected death, and that is the realization that, yes, this is all Everything is ephemeral. Like, where we mm-hmm. have no idea, and they're... If you can, if you can like sit with that peacefully, like you, you're free. Then also. you're, yeah, then you, exactly. You're, yeah. you really are. If you can have that grace yeah, and, and wisdom to say, I don't have control yeah, and I'm sure. just going to live with, with yeah. grace and be grateful for whatever it is, the hurt, the agony, the triumph, the joy, like that to me is true wisdom. Totally. And there is very little on that, that I feel like. At least we'll we get- have no, we, we just don't have the language for it. Like I always say mm-hmm. this, like we shouldn't be practicing for death since like the moment we're born. <laughs> we should be talking about death uh-huh. since the moment. We should be like joking about it. We should be um, discussing what we well, want to do with our that bodies. Is we always, in my family, we talk about like, thank you, uh, Lion King, um, the circle of life, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, particularly in death and especially with young kids, my father-in-law passed away a couple of years ago and it was really hard for my sons, right? Because they, they haven't experienced much death. But even when I think about the heartache that comes from, again, a, a child um, being um, being ridiculed or just any of those, like you say, those feelings don't last. Yeah, and so temporary. Yeah, and that, I feel like there is, I mean, both the joy as well as the pain. I mean, there's something exquisitely liberating yeah. to like really internalize that. And then it's like, okay, I, I'm I'm gonna um, save so like, more of this rather than I came from a family that talked about death all the time. Oh, so I'm not afraid of death at all. And I'm surprised hearing that every time I see a family that is not comfortable with death, I'm like, I feel so fortunate. I didn't even realize it wasn't normal. Like my grandma, way before she was gonna die, if you were like, Grandma, I love this little butterfly dish. Like the next day when you opened it, there'd be a post-it that would say your name. Take it, take it when you die. Like, oh my god. And, and in our family also, it was always open casket and like my husband, the first time he came to a funeral at my family, he was so horrified because my uncle Rand was taking pictures of us with my grandma and her kids. Oh, wow. It was just like, that's what happens. And my grandma would be like, when I die, and like, oh, and then one time she was like, and then when your mother dies, I was like, what? She's like, she's gonna die. Oh, that's, I love that. Yeah, and I'm like, I and it really horrifies 
some of my friends and family, I'll be like, so if I die, I want you to know this. And I'm like, I'm saying, that's right. I mean, we know I'm going to die. I'm saying like if something tragic happens, here's like the Wi-Fi like. password. Like it sounds dumb, but where are you going to find the Wi-Fi password? No, it's super when important actually. When my stepdad actually. died, I had to figure out how to get into all of his bank accounts. Oh yeah, no. It's, it was horrifying. It was horrible. Oh, I can't imagine. Oh yeah, no, my, 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 it took me a year to get to my own money. Yeah. Oh. It's, it was a mess. You don't it's even a just, think yeah. about it because people are fucking terrified to be like, if I die, and for people euphemistically, if something happens. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And I have started saying that because people don't like when I say if I die. But that comfort with death. However, I did not. One of my best friends died unexpectedly two and a half years ago. And I that was a different thing because it was like, well, my parents, my whatever. And I even thought about if Yvonne died, my husband. But when she, when Misty died, I was, it was so mind blowing that the most alive person I'd ever met just died like that. And she was terrified of doctors, terrified to talk about her health. And that's why she died. And it, it, it was, it was like, I thought I was so comfortable with it and I wasn't, con- I wasn't ready for that. Not that. Yeah. I wasn't, yeah and yeah. I didn't. Yeah. As long as it's in the right order mm-hmm. of things. Yeah. 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 It was like, no, I, I'm comfortable with that. I, but I was like, I couldn't eat. I couldn't think I got two speeding tickets but in I a month. So like for it to be comfortable, to know that something's happening and then to actually deal with it actually happening. Yeah. Like you can be prepared. Yeah. You can prepare for something your entire life, but you're never going to know how you, you feel. But that's the whole point. The point. You can prepare for something your whole life and you're, so why worry? Why spend all this time and energy worrying yeah. about something? Because it's gonna like right that yes like in a like i'm you're basically saying you know what i mean you're saying yeah, yeah. by saying that like because you 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 were prepared i, I could know. not have known what it would feel like to get a call and i and i and i a big thing that hit me when misty died was i never thought about what it would feel like to call our other friends and say she's gone yeah. I never thought. you don't yeah you don't think about never these thought yeah never just and then be like I'm so sorry Misty's gone. Like, what the fuck? I had no way to prepare for that. And I would never have known that that would have been harder than hearing it. You know what I mean? But, and that's even being prepared, but talking about it right now, someone's going, oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. Right? So how have your kids, or I should ask it a slightly different way, um, have they, have they pushed back? Have they, have they been resentful? Or have they, you know, because it's fine for you as a mom to have been as outspoken and so totally. forth, different for kids. Have, yeah. have you faced any blowback from them? I know other people yeah. have judged, but no, from them. No, I haven't, honestly. And like my kids are like my biggest, like ride or die, like will throw down for me or like super mm-hmm. protective of me, um, really proud of me. Um, I've never, I've every time something's come out or I've written something that I know is gonna be controversial, I've prepared them for it. Okay. I've given them like validated whatever feelings they have, whether it's frustration, any anger, embarrassment, et cetera. Mm. Every single time they're like, I love you. I'm pr- I'm so proud of you. Like you're so brave. Like whatever. She still say whatever. And people have made comments to them about me. Like her friends have made comments about like they've heard all mm. sorts. And they're they literally like probably of of they're the least judgmental of me of anyone in my life. Because they know all of you. Yeah, but and they've well, and I've never the truth- pretended like I was anyone else. I've never been like I'm I, like the pl- plate breaking. Like I wrote about that in my book because that whole scene. Because they were like, "Whoa!" Because I'm pretty chill. Like mm-hmm. I'm not an angry person. Mm-hmm. I don't. I'm like not a disciplinarian at all. <laughs> like I'm super. Like I've always been the. And so I do not do things like break plates. Like mm-hmm. I don't even raise my voice usually. So mm-hmm. when that happened, oh. they all were like, what yeah. the fuck? Yeah. They were all just like oh, standing there. So must have been so worried about you. And they're like, what? And like, I basically was like, yeah, I'm also this. Yeah. Like I have a breaking point. Like yeah. it takes a lot to get me to that point. But I had, you know, it was like Hal had died. We were just, it was like, I think that was, covid i was i was, oh, doing, right. I was doing i had four kids on my own in my oh. home while writing a book i had like so much responsibility and i just had a moment where i was like i don't well and you were in grief i mean like come on yeah yeah but like the moment was yeah. just like i don't want to do the fucking dishes like yeah i don't want to do this there's too much like i want to break and i have no break and so i'm gonna fucking start breaking shit like it was a, and my daughter like put her entire i don't even remember if this is in the book but she, I was like, I basically like had this whole monologue to my kids as I stood there like in my broken dishes, which they'll for sure remember forever. 
Um, and my daughter, I like curl. I just like fell to the ground, like too oh pathetically. And then my daughter, like my who's now like at the time, I guess she was a teenager then, but she's about to be sixteen. She like threw her entire body over my body, like mm. like like just wrapped herself around me as I was on the ground and was just oh like, God, oh, that makes sat me there. Yeah. Mm -hmm tearful but like that is how i feel like that is how i've been with them their whole lives like just like i will fucking well you're like you're and the thing that's amazing about that is that you were there you're authentic like you were fucking there yeah and just i feel like what a lot like a lot like, of us we to be our arms yeah. because we don't yeah. have that the totally. courage and we're distracted yeah. and we're wearing the fucking mask and also they they had a complicated relationship with our dad too because he was a difficult person and mm. so my me talking about my complicated grief allowed them to do the same thing sure. and they had very similar feelings that i did they mm -hmm. had i'm so glad i don't have to walk on eggshells in my own house anymore oh. right i'm so glad i'm not living with someone who yells all the time this you know mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. we live in a very peaceful harmonious house that we that was not peaceful and harmonious when he was here and so they're oh, wow. that they, they can still talk about loving him and missing him and how funny he was and all these other things but they can also say oh my god i'm so glad dad isn't here because for this because he would have freaked yeah. out yeah that he would have you know and that's part of the grief experience too is feeling like you can talk about that mm -hmm. and you know we we talk about all the different layers of them and when i die they're you know my kids have like a group chat where they talk shit about me and like mom like make fun of me <laughs> that's great yeah 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 that's yeah. fine yeah well it's also human die, they're gonna have, yes yeah. so and they know that they know like when you when when i grow up and die and you want to write a memoir tell all about like me you're like it's already out there fuckers. i'll be the first <laughs> but, but like that's and they you know my my son just started writing his own sub stack and it was interesting because to your point about my parents i remember he started writing publicly about things that were like a little bit um controversial mm -hmm. and i was like oh my god this is how my parents felt yeah like, that's hilarious this is yeah. how my parents <laughs> karma. and i literally oh. called my mom and i was like i don't think i've ever like formally thanked you oh. for like i mean i've done it in my book and i've done it like thanks for your support but like I was a really hard daughter mm. for my parents. Like, I wrote about a very, you know, I mean, they live in, like, the suburbs. It's a very different kind of environment. Mm -hmm. They never, ever once were anything but supportive of my work. Oh, my God, I, work. I, and I, I love I, your parents. Let's like, have a dinner for them. I know. <laughs> ever. Like, no matter what I write, wrote about, ever. Um, even, like, as a teenager. Like, never. Can I? But I, I, this is so important. And, and I, my I, grandparents, by the way, I have well, to say, all the generations. All right. Well, let's let's have a. Is is your maiden name Wolf? Yeah. Okay. No, I never. I never. Okay. Yeah, I would never. I mean, let's have a big dinner for the wolf. The wolf. The, yeah. the, the, the wolf. wolf. No, but I think about especially uh, LGBTQ kids who don't have that support. Oh. Right. And you're, you know, and obviously for for you to be as outspoken, I just for all the parents listening, like just love your kids as they are. Is what I want to say. Yeah, they can't because their egos are too wrapped up. Well, and the it's judgment like, and and all the masks yeah. and they're not having done their own work. But like, yeah, seriously, it, it is so heartening to me. And and these are the kind of stories I want to share here on our podcast. Like, be that be that mom or be that grandparent because that's how you set yourself free and and, and yeah. the ripple effect. But it also means you have to you have to deal with your shit on your own. Yeah, because that's the reality. And when when your kids are writing stuff, there's going to be stuff that you have to deal with. You're saying you already did it. You did with it on your own. You didn't go straight to him. And that's the trick. Don't yeah, go straight exactly. to them. Process your shit. Talk to your friends. Call your therapist. Don't go straight to the kid and be like, what are you doing? Yeah. Why are you? Well, also, like, I think it's a really, it's so interesting because, like, people have been giving me shit my entire parenting that I'm ruining fucking up my kids, right? Yeah. And now they're at an age where I can tell you that, like, I actually didn't fuck them up. They're yeah, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's been really interesting too, is like all the people that are like, you're so blah, 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 all this, like literally like, I dare you to come for me now. Like yeah. look, look at me. And so not the like your kids are su like whatever, like your parenting doesn't necessarily like affect your kids completely. And like, there's all these variables, right? But I've been getting a lot of shit for the way I parent my entire parenting, which has been very honest, very open, but also I've only ever validated my kids. And mm -hmm. so- I'm not surprised that they also validate me because yeah. I raised That's them in an environment created. where like there was no, we never shame anybody. No one ever gets shamed for anything. We don't, that's like that. You can say fuck all you, like there's all these different, Yeah. if you, there's no shame in my house. Like if you want to walk around naked and like someone like, it is like, yeah, 
there's that's it right they don't shame me i don't like there's never been um and i do truly feel like if you raise your kids in an environment of of validation unconditional validation even if you don't necessarily agree from validate i could just say unconditional emotional validation yeah i will always validate every single feeling they have mm-hmm. even because i think a lot of parents would be like oh you're 15 you don't know what love is or like oh, or, you don't know what you're so talking cool. about like there's so yeah. much like this is some this like the, I'm the authority and you're not. That's why that fucking question, what advice did you give your teenage self? Mm-hmm. I think is super harmful. It's saying mm-hmm. the same thing. It's saying that young people don't, don't have, know don't know right. who they are. They totally do. Mm-hmm. And if you're a parent and you're treating your child like someone who doesn't know themselves, guess what you're doing? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You're so raising someone who's never gonna well, believe who, in who, themselves. Yeah, raises a themselves. lot of self doubt. Right, hundred yeah. percent. And I truly grew up in a home where I was validated for who I was. I was never. De- Regardless of how, I mean, I was an insane teenager, like, by the way, I was not like, oh my God, I would have so much fun with you. Yeah. (laughs) I want to go back and hang with you. And I was like, my parents weren't super happy, but they never told me, they never shamed me. They always validated like who I was and where I was and were always proud of me, even if I was fucking up and making mistakes. And I truly think that that's That's the most important. Do you think our kids' generation is generally going to be healthier than we were? Not as us as individuals, like Generation X and the elder millennials. Do you feel like these Gen Zs? I feel like they're healthier than us, like emotionally. Yeah, they just seem like, like my my son's friends. I'm blown away by like they're so freaking smart. Yeah, even these the because some of them are no, they, yeah. It feels like there's greater emotional intelligence. Yeah, and yet, but the data says otherwise, right? That there's know. more self harm. There's you know suicide rates, or, or maybe they're reporting it. I I think there was I think that, bad I think shit when I we think were young. That that's a lot of it. And like I, lo- I think like everyone's I'm, hyper reporting, uh-huh. hyper diagnosing. Well, and like if you came from like a religious family in my town, I know a girl who had made suicide attempts. Nobody would ever have known. It never would have been a, a reported because it was not appropriate. And now I think oh, yeah, well, totally. And that's the whole point. We, yeah. But I mean, when I think the loneliness epidemic. The reason there's a lo- a big reason there's a loneliness epidemic is because people are I think are afraid to be who they really are, mm-hmm. right? And so then we suffer in in isolation. I mean, yes, cell phones and there have been a whole a host of other things that have contributed, but it does feel like the loneliness epidemic is is massively magnified because if you can't be who you really are, you are going to be behind a mask and behind a wall, and you're going to feel lonely. So painful. And in the extreme, you're going to be in a rage, or you're going to be in a dark depression. And so I, that's back to the, you know, when I read yeah. your book, I was just like, okay, yes, the marriage and the grief are a huge, you know, the, um, yep, those things are a huge part of it. But I just feel like there's so many um, bigger themes that you tapped into that are really important that a lot of people don't talk about. And I know you read yeah. about a lot of this stuff. So yeah. what? We're going to talk a moment in a moment about your podcast when we wrap up. But what what have we not talked about that's important to you? Um, I mean, we didn't we didn't really talk about dating. I think the one night stand conversation is really interesting because that's just something that gets like a lot of certainty. And you you mentioned it like mm-hmm. momentarily mm-hmm. about the um, like the emphasis we put on. Um, well, permanence and, and yeah. building and building something and that's meant to like, last. How did you make it work for twenty five years? And yeah. like, like we've we you know all the different also like verbs like we fought to make it work or like all the different oh, yeah. things that people use mm-hmm. to like I hate it to sort of um, to validate their struggles mm-hmm. and validate each other's and their mm-hmm. struggles and like look I my parents are still married they're happily married I know a lot of people that are happily married I'm not like hating on marriage by any like mm-hmm. degree. But I do think it's harmful when you make, when, when the longevity, when the time mm-hmm. becomes this thing, we worship it. I remember mm-hmm. my grandparents, they celebrated their 75th wedding anniversary. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. And everyone, and, and I obviously like, I love them and I'm, hooray, you've been married for 75 years. But their marriage, I saw it. It was full of anger mm-hmm. and it, they, and they never seemed happy. And I always hated going over there because they were fighting. Mm-hmm. And here we are. Elephant in the room. Congratulations on being married for 75 years. Yeah. Well, it didn't seem like a very happy one. And when my grandmother died, my grandfather became like a different person, like oh, happier than he's ever been in his life. too. He was like a new person. Yeah. And my but- dad would be jealous because we got the nicest guy in the world and my dad got this yes harsh angry person truly exactly. And so that is actually not that far from my experience, right? Mm-hmm. Which is like I got times seven. I got times six. Right. Or except for I was 30 more years. Yeah. Except for I was 30 30 30 seven. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so, but because they had a long marriage, because, you know, because mm-hmm. they, whatever. But yeah. my point is that this is very common. Well, those are, yeah, the to... cultural norms. And you just want yeah. to say, you're right. Yeah. The elephant in the room. Yeah. Like, can we just be honest? But the emperor has no clothes. Drives, yeah. But this is what drives me crazy. And then you have the same people who are like calling me a slut or whatever mm-hmm. for having like. Enjoying sex. You as <laughs> having sex with all a lot because yeah. I'm not, I don't want to be in a long term relationship. So there's something wrong with me. And then everyone starts dying. Well, I feel like you that's and... feminist, being a feminist on your, on your own terms. Yep. To me, I say hallelujah. For sure. But like people, it is not societally celebrated. Well, for, no, I Especially totally agree. But when I... you have children and you're at a certain age, you're not supposed no, to. No, I to... not supposed to. No, yeah. I totally agree. But like the, to your point, what you said earlier about, ephemera and about that's what i think is really beautiful about connecting with people knowing that you're gonna then leave them that, that's it. them again it's, like that's to me practicing death right it's practicing mm-hmm. letting that's go cool. if you can get yourself to a point where you can connect with people and then let them go as soon as you realize it's not working which is to me what i've been doing for the last six years it's like I can be in a relationship with someone, and as soon as it feels like this isn't benefiting us, I can go. Rebecca, I'm yeah. never going to see you again after this, but I, I've loved every moment of it. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, like that to me, it's like you are yeah. becoming a great Buddhist. I'm trying to be a great Buddhist. It's very Buddhist, yeah. Right? Just yeah. I, I think of the just these like wonderful sparkling moments at a coffee bar or right. with a stranger. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's like, oh my God, something magical happened. Yeah. Like, great right. life. Right? Yeah. I mean, there is something really compelling that's about death, that. Right? Like seeing each other yes. in yeah. a way that's yeah. like, we don't owe each other anything. 100%. And, there, and something really cool happened. Totally. And that's it. And you know what I love, it, even in our, I think we were talking about this this morning because we did all these like cool shoots yesterday. The feeling in our nervous system of something really magical and ephemeral just happened. Yeah. And it's in my body now. Yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. I'll take yeah. it. That's literally, and I do truly feel like that's, that's how we practice how to be better at death. Right. I like that. We, we spent, we have a weekend away at a retreat or like we sent our kids to camp and when they come back and they're like, oh my God, I'm going to miss so-and-so. I'll probably never see them again. You yeah. say, yeah, totally. <laughs> you totally probably won't. But yeah. Like, yeah. Wasn't that amazing to have this experience mm. and now you get to let, you let it go and we have to learn. I mean, I literally that, have like feeling it on my son. Yeah, I see yeah. that. Let go. Um, which I got when I dropped my son off at college. I literally mm. dropped him off was walking through the rain to like the nearest tattoo parlor. I'm just like, they're like, what are you getting? And I'm like, I guess let go because that's what I need to figure mm-hmm. out how to be better at. Mm-hmm. So like, it's still a practice, obviously, even though I feel like I'm actually gotten really good at it. But that's that's practicing how to, you know, like it's like, it's a lifelong Well, practice. and that to me is so, that is like a great humanizing gift, again, that we can only give ourselves. Totally. Right? Because I feel like this, uh, you know, and I've I've been guilty of like, oh, nostalgia, and you know, whether it's, I, I I mean, so many of my team members have heard me talk wistfully. My son's only 14. My older son's only 14. He's going to be home for another four years, but I'm already like wringing oh, my yeah. hands. I don't want to leave him to leave for college. But yeah. so yeah. it's like, why do I do that to myself? Yeah. Right. So it is a practice. But I do also think, and I don't know if this is your experience when your son went to like the anticipatory grief is so much more hardcore oh, than good. the actual oh, good. grief. Right. I want to talk about shitting the nest. Do you um, know about shitting the nest? No, I yeah. have heard that. So you know how they, they leave the nest? Uh, Before they leave the nest, they shit the nest, which is makes them, they're so make annoying. Make it so much easier to so like get out. That you're fine letting them go. And like, I wasn't fine letting him go, but yeah. I felt a little easier. He, he was so ready to go yeah. like he was busting out of the confines yeah like, like that baby that's 40 weeks and ready to be born yeah that was my son the day before he left for college okay so no shame with rebecca wolf yeah we've got a handful of episodes recorded when yeah. is it when does it, it actually is later this summer okay i'm really excited all the guests on on my podcast have been like basically burned at the stake at some point in like cancel culture life. yeah yeah and like they've they have basically done the thing that they're not supposed to do mm-hmm. and like survived coming out the other side of basically been, being unashamed of the things that they were told they should, they should feel shame for. Um, All women. I mean, it's just to justifies Nietzsche's what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. To- uh, <laughs> totally, for sure. And also, you know, when they burned Joan of Arc at the stake, you know, like they couldn't burn her. And so they right. Had to her heart. And so it's like, oh, it's like you can't. You can't love that. You can't love that. That's gonna be you your can't burn these bitches. Yeah, your uh, yeah. your icon or your tried. logo. They have tried. Yeah, that's those really are, cool. those are like my those are my people. Yeah, those are my women. And that's the thing too. I think you get to a point too where you're like, oh, I'm. This is my community now. Like I don't I don't even know how to be in community with women who aren't getting shit for the work they're doing. Yeah, right. Like 
and that it's hard for it's hard to relate yeah and though but those are my favorite people so great mm-hmm. so now i'm at a point in my mm-hmm. career where That's i awesome. get to just hang out with all of the like the island of misfit toys of like women artists uh-huh. who have been cast out of whatever you know have been told whatever, whatever they yeah, yeah 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 like th- this and there's a long I'm, list of them right yeah <laughs> And I, and I'm on honestly, like in my work, I'm just here welcoming in anyone else mm. who wants to join us. Like that's, that's awesome. what my classes are. That's what the podcast is doing. It's basically saying like, okay, like there's fucking room on the Island for you too. Yeah. And well, and that's, but I feel like the bottom line for that is to, to own yourself in, in your own fully authentic way. I mean, I like this. I don't know why the book, the Scarlet Letter keeps coming oh, into yeah, my sorry, mind. I mean, literally by the name, by the way, okay. my daughter's band name. Oh, is a band <laughs> called the Scarlet <laughs> Letters. Woo! Yeah. But oh that, God. I mean, I and that's, 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 yeah, that's what, I mean, but it's, it's not safe because like you say, it is culturally, we, we want women to conform Right. And I think about like, no, nothing, no shade. Oh, maybe a little shade against the Catholic church, like command and control, you know, our politics. Like, I feel like institutionally we are built for command and control. Yeah. Right. And so then when you have brave bitches that are like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. Then it, it disrupts the, the cultural order and the institutional order. And the thing is, no one was ever actually being controlled by these institutions. They just told a great lie about it. That's the whole thing is it's, I, don't know. I think they have been controlled. I mean, I think a oh, lot they've been of controlled, people like told the I mean line, is, told the line, told the line. Yeah. And then like did stuff in secret or, like, yeah, or suffered this and, perfect image that my grandparents had of my grandpa, the doctor, and my grandma, this beautiful homemaker. He was a asshole. And yeah, he was yeah. having affairs. And he was, he was. Well, that, yeah, that's that, the big lie. Like, it looked perfect. And so all along, when was it ever actually perfect? When were people oh, no. actually conforming? Totally. It, yeah, yeah, but, it, but, but you're right that they artifice, were controlling them. But that, to me, is the artifice. Yeah. And where, when you have people that are disrupting that and saying, look, yeah. the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. It's like... Don't say that. You know, now you're now we're going to shame you for telling the truth. I mean, that's always my argument is like, I'm not doing anything that like a million trillion other women haven't yes. always done. I'm just talking about it. Like, yeah, people are like, oh, my God, will you know, like mm-hmm. there's nothing mm-hmm. original about what I'm saying. There's nothing original about what I'm doing or writing about. It's just that people people are all experiencing exactly what I'm experiencing. They just haven't. They're just not talking about it. Well, you're put. Yeah. And that's I think what's so courageous is you're putting it and, you you know, you write so beautifully and so honestly, and and then you've got a large following. So, you know, it's one thing to put it in your journal and nobody looks at it versus in your case, millions of people between reading your book and reading your work, you know, so that became a threat. And thank you for it. All right, we got to wrap up, Rebecca. Thank you for having this me. This is the death of this episode. Oh, this episode is dying David. now. Okay, we're going to just do a little ceremony <laughs> to let it go. All right. All right. In all, all seriousness, right. this is awesome. You are brilliant. Thanks Thank for being Thank you for on. having me. Open I really appreciate it. I Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to share. I, I can think of some people that would benefit from your writing yeah. classes. Yeah, and... let me know. It's, it's like, it's pinned to my profile on Instagram. It's like, you know, in the top. Oh, what's of the your pin. Instagram for it's, the oh, it's, to My Instagram is Rebecca Wolf with three O's. And my website is Rebecca Wolf at Substack. It's called The Braid, my Substack. And I think that's, yeah. All right. Okay. This is a wrap to Open Relationships, Transforming Together. Thanks for listening. Please follow us, like us, give us your feedback, give us your advice. You can email us at openrelationships at your tango.com. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. We've never been able to clap afterward. Here we go.